Let me start with uh, what I've learned this week. One of the most important elements, I think, that I've learned was that people who read inscriptions read what they have learned to see. Once you know what the characters mean, you know how to read the inscription. Otherwise, it's a jumble of characters which do not make much sense to the uninterested or even the un invited and the learned people. And I think the same happens with how to write history. When I was involved in a number of projects in the past on how to write history, that we, and particularly that we do it as a reception history, pretty much as we were just shown with um, my predecessor today, how traditions move from one element to the next century and further centuries and people receive elements and then ameliorate them and change them according to the mode of the day. I also worked in reception studies, but I was dissatisfied with A, the name of reception and B, even with the approach. Why? When we talk about reception history in the last, let's say, 30, 40 years, it was intended to move away from the idea of the origin of the author or of a particular text or an element, and to move more into the people who look at things and who receive these things, who read these things, and then transform them by watching or listening or writing or rewriting these elements. And yet, when we talk about reception, despite the fact that we wanted to move away from the author and the original to see the readers, it still maintained its kind of secondary nature that the people who receive things are at the receiving end and are not the authors, are not the agents of what they receive. And that's what dissatisfied me, because quite often when we look, for example, today, the elements that people received from the first or second century in, in the fourth and fifth century, these things, uh, these, these things were so much transformed that I think reception is not the right term for that kind of development. And secondly, when do we want to move into the people who are the agents of their time? I think, for example, we as historians today, we are the agents of our writing of history. And we are not just on the receiving side of 2000 years of history, but we have, and we are creating what we do, of course, on the basis of what we received, but it's no longer just the reception. And the third thing why I was so dissatisfied with the idea of reception was that when we look into the many series that we have of reception history, we have the reception of Plato throughout the centuries, very famous about Aristotle through the centuries, we have Philo, we have, well, we have white old men like myself um, received through whatever. I don't know of any reception history series of a woman. We have, I've participated in one reception history of a female reading of the Bible, but then it's still the Bible, the book of old men who are then received by women. So you can even see that the reception perspective, it's not just the name, it's even the perspective is eliminating uh, a lot of perspectives which we would like to take today. So I was thinking about how to replace that and how to approach writing history differently. And so I wrote in 2019, the book, which you see on the left, writing the history of early Christianity from reception to what I then called retrospection. And retrospection is not just, as you see in the middle of the, the new book, which is just coming out with the Kreuter now with two colleagues as a, um, um, a book with quite a number of different disciplines and colleagues contributing. It's not just the reverse of the timeline. You see this one-way story street in New York. 
Um, it's not just saying, well, when I write history, I have to invert the timeline. And instead of writing a chronological history, as we usually do, so we start with year whatever you start with, and you grow older with your protagonists. Yeah, when you write about Caesar, you start with whenever, and then you end up with his death. It's not just the reverse of timeline that I'm writing now anachronologically against the chronology. It is a bit like archaeology. You have to start from the top, which is our present time, and there's a kind of presentism by slicing history back down. I will give you just one example what difference it makes. When I was in Malaga um, last, not two years ago, P P Picasso's uh, home, there is a fantastic museum on the retrospection of Picasso, but it's not the retrospection in my sense. Because on the ground floor, you see the first works of young Picasso as a grandiose 16-year-old who paints already, and you can see the genius of his future. In the first floor, you see then the maturing artist who becomes known worldwide. And in the second floor, you can see it's the grandmaster of the century. And that's the way we usually write history. We see in the seeds what becomes the end, and the end is always us. Reversing the timeline is not just reversing it, but it is disturbing this kind of chronological continuity where you start with what you know from the end, of course, and then in the 16 year old, you see the genius. But if you, if you started from today and would be critical of each of these floors, you would see that, for example, if at the age of 18, he would have been fed up with painting and would have entered the military, he would have never become the genius. So it's a thousand million <coughs> possibilities that history could turn in different ways. So you lose when you go retrospectively into history, you lose the sense of continuity. And you ask yourself, and you have to ask yourself, what difference does it make the way we look at history? I will show you one example, because in this book, I have used four examples where I attempted to write history in a retrospective mode and to test whether I come up with different uh, results from the way things have always been regarded. And in the book on the right side, I have tested the same kind of retrospection on the history of early Christianity, where I didn't start from the year zero, but I started from today, made a big jump into the year 1000, and then moved from 1000 backwards century by century to end up in the second and then at the end of the first century. Interestingly, the book was terribly uh, done because of the printer, because I also reversed all life dates of my authors. So instead of giving the birth date first and the death date second, I reversed, and believe me, twice the printers and the redactors had turned around <laughs> the, the dates. He couldn't live with that. So at the end, I accepted that the dates are as we usually have them, he still accepted that my introduction is at the end of the book and, <laughs> <laughs> and the postscript is at the beginning. But you can see introductions we always write at the end and not in the beginning. So to have the introduction at the end is a beginning of retrospection. Anyway, so the case study which I'd like to show you is an inscription. And I promise you, I only have two tombstones today. So uh, shouldn't be too long. What the history of this Aversius inscription is, it's a Greek inscription. It's been called the queen of early Christian inscriptions. So from the 19th century, since Ramsey had discovered the tombstones, and I will show you the tombstones, this was regarded as the inscription of early Christianity. Why? It's not the oldest, but it's the most extensive one, which was dated to the second century. I'll show you the um, reproduction, which you find in the museum here in Cristiano. So this is when you come into the museum, you quite quickly see this immense monument showing that this is the 
yeah, the lady and queen, the utmost uh, of our early Christian inscriptions. Why is it so important? Well, the inscription was known by the life of a bishop, of the Bishop Aversius. And for centuries, particularly since the Reformation, the Protestants have always believed this is a fake. This is just fiction from the life of Aversius. Then Ramsey, who himself comes from the Tübingen school, from Bauer, uh, he got convinced through archaeology and, and epigraphy uh, that the Bible is correct. And he discovered on the right side, first of all, the two fragments of this tombstone. And you can see in the middle there is an inscription. We will have the text quite soon. And he, he remembered that this inscription he knew because this part of the inscription, which we find on the fragment stone, is, as we will see, identical to a part, the inner part, of the inscription which we know from the life of Abertius. A few years later, he discovered a second tombstone, this time a tombstone that is even dated, that's the middle one, that's the tombstone of a certain Alexander. And again, he discovered that this tombstone has identical text to the Abertius inscription, because what we have on the reconstruction on the top, bottom is what we find on the Alexander tombstone. The middle part is this part, as we quickly see, is what we have here. So putting those together, Ramsey said, now I have proof that the Avertius inscription of the Vita is not a fiction, but we have archaeological proof that the that this text of the Avertius inscription is or has existed and ended up being used in the Vita. So for him, it was clear. So we have a bishop, because that's what the inscription, I will have the text soon, what the inscription describes us is a bishop by the name of Avertius, who lives, as we will quickly see, in, uh, in Phrygia around the years 190. And even the epigraphers, uh, at least my colleagues in Kings, uh, were supportive of the idea that the inscription of the fragments of the stone dates from around the end of the second century. Then we have the reconstruction here, just mentioning, uh, meaning that this is the, the, the tombstone fragment, and we have the Alexander um, tombstone. Now, how does the beginning and the end of the inscription ends up on the Alexander tombstone. Ramsey said it must have been that the workshop that produced the Alexander tombstone must have known the Avertius tombstone and must have copied the beginning and the end. And that's how we got to the Alexander tombstone and just replacing Avertius by putting in Alexander. The rest is pretty much the same as the of oh, its inscription. So that's the, that was the state of the art until 2019, until I published the book. And it's still the state of the art when you follow the epigraphers, because epigraphy is a pretty traditional uh, trait. So um, changing things is as difficult as changing the minds of theologians, but that's the nature of our subjects. Here is Phrygia, today San Dikli is the old Hierapolis, don't um, mistake Hierapolis of Regia with one of the other six or seven Hierapolis that we have in, in and around Mediterranean. Yeah? It's not uh, the one with the, um, the, the uh, hot springs. Yeah? Now, let me start with the Alexander inscription because it's quite an interesting one because it's dated to the year 216. Now here we have in the beginning, as you can see, eclectes, polios of the taste, tut, epoesa, zon, ten, echo, faneros, and so forth. So we have um, a, a, a self-description of a, a citizen of a famous city, a, a chosen city, even eclectes, yeah? And he says what he has done in uh, this, and, 
Tulonoma Alexandros Antoniu Matetes Poimenos Hagnu. So he is by name Alexander of Antonio. He is the student, Matetes, of a Hagnu Poimenos, of a, a, shepherd, a shepherd of uh, renown. At the end of the tombstone, it's quite interesting because we have one of these uh, famous um, uh, requests that people who dare to use or reuse his tomb, they have to pay 2,000 2, gold uh, coins to the um, tax office, to the tax office, as you can see, uh, of Europolis. Yeah? And this is by far the highest of those payments to be made from tombstones we know in the region of Phrygia and even beyond. It's an enormous amount which is being asked for. So what I've said is beginning and end is preserved in the Alexander. The middle part is preserved in the two fragments that we can see. Let's come to the text. I quickly read through um, the, yeah. I quickly read through the English translation that comes to the music, yeah? So he is from a chosen city, this monument I made while living, so that I might have been in public the resting place of my body, being by name a virtuous who is the disciple of a holy shepherd, who feeds flocks of sheep on mountains and on plains, who has great eyes that see everywhere, for this shepherd taught me a reliable thing, a vitamins. I've got the blue now, because that is now the text preserved on our fragments. So the first part, the upper first part, as you can see, is the Alexander, that ends with the shepherd. The black hat one is not preserved. The blue one is then preserved on the, on the so-called fragment stone, stone fragment. Here again, we have um, a text that is not preserved, and at the end, that's the Alexander. To Rome, he who sent me to contemplate the queen and to see a princess golden robe and golden sandal, I saw yet there are people bearing a shining mark. And the plain of Syria I saw in all the cities, Nishidis, when I passed over the Euphrates. But everywhere I had brethren. I had potentially Paul, because it's exactly where the, the, the two fragments are broken, but it could be Paul. Faith everywhere led me forward and provided food everywhere, fish from a fountain of exceeding great size and perfect, which a holy virgin drew with her hands and gives to friends to eat. It had wine of great virtue, giving it mingled with bread. These things I, a verse whose having been a witness, told to be written here, verily I was passing through my 72nd year. He that learns these things, every fellow that he pray for our virtues, and no one shall put another grave over my grave. But if he does, then he shall pay for the treasury of the Romans 2,000 pieces of gold to my good native city of Hierapolis, 1,000 pieces of gold. What made me suspicious when I was reading the history retrospectively. And the history of this monument means that by the year 1977, we have around 100 studies of this inscription alone. Amongst them, I mean, more than 10 monographs just dealing with this inscription. And I can promise you since 1977, I've seen several more monographs, let alone articles. I got suspicious because I was reading backwards from today into the, into the fifth century. And I was wondering, when did we get this idea of this inscription? So what's the formative basis? And I discovered the formative basis is first of all, the life of others. And I was surprised when I wrote the book in 2016, that this life of Avertus was not translated into any European language except Russian, because the editor in 1917 was Russian. So no English, no German, no French, no Italian, nothing. In the meantime, several 
translations have appeared, but not in 2016. So I studied the Greek text and I was asking myself, what's the nature of this life? When was it written? That all people in the meantime agree, fifth century. What kind of a word is, is mentioned there? Do we have an information about an Avertius of Hierapolis before? Interestingly, in none of the synods, we have any bishop from Hierapolis before the fifth century. Then the text itself seems to be fifth century, a supportive writing for a bishop that has the theological, more Catholic tradition of Chalcedon, of the, of the enormous, uh, important um, council in 451. So that's what we get from the uh, Vita. And then I discovered a colleague from Oxford, Tonemann, who has written the only study to that time on the Vita. And he discovered that the Vita incorporates a letter by Mark O'Reilly. However, he, he, he shows that this is an unknown original letter by Mark O'Reilly because the letter mentions jobs and titles that only existed in the first two centuries. However, immediately in the letter, when the name Avertius appears, and then the letter invites Avertius to come to Rome to heal the daughter of the emperor, and which Avertius then does, he heals the daughter, he has this dream in the night that he should create, a, or he should use a Roman tombstone and inscribe it with his inscription to show the people the journey he made to convert the emperor. Of course, we don't know of any emperor in the second century, and not Mark Aurel, who was converted to Christianity. But that's the Vita's intention to show that this Avertius was converting the emperor's household because of his magical uh, ways of dealing and healing uh, the daughter. Okay, so he has this vision. In the dream, the, the, the Roman tomb with the inscription flies to Hierapolis from Rome where he is, and then he goes there and dies and the tombstone was there. So that's more or less in Vita in short. Now, the Tonemann discovered that from the moment that Avertius is mentioned in this letter of Mark Aurel, jobs appear, military jobs appear, that were only introduced by Constantine. And that made Tonemann suggest that the author of the Vita uses fragments and spolia to have a historical grounding of the Vita, but then creates a fiction and creates his Avertius with it. And then I was asking myself, if the Vita is the foundation from which we have to start reading our fragments, maybe the suggestion that Tonemann makes for Mark Aurel's letter should also and could also be applied to our inscription. And now we discover Avertius is not mentioned in one of our spolia because the spolia, the spolia sorry, that exists mentions Alexandrus, Antonia. Where Avertius starts, our fragments do not exist. Then we have this half Christianized vision, which then is disrupted because we have then the narrative that starts with Ace Roman. And that's the beginning of the fragment which we have seen on the stone that exists. So this is the inscription from the stone. And the stone of inscriptions ends where the lady gives the whole version through with her hands and gives to the friends to eat. That's it. The next part does not exist on any of our fragments. So we'll not be surprised that in that part, which does not exist in fragments, we have quite soon I Avertius, 
having been a witness told to be written here. So it's a divine message that Avertius is putting down here. And he supports his authenticity by saying, verily, truly. So don't get me wrong, I'm not torturer. No, verily, I'm passing through my second, my 17 second year. And that this, that should be bold as well, sorry, because that's still not in uh, reserve. He that learns these things, even ever let him pray for Avertius. And exactly where Avertius ends, the preserved text of Alexander starts again. And then we have this thing that one shouldn't put uh, down another person into the tomb. So I think instead of our, our Vita from the fifth century being a receiver and the reception of an inscription which is partly preserved, I think it's exactly the other way around that the author of the Vita just like with, with the letter of Mark Aurel, made use of a spolia, of several spolia, namely of a tombstone by Alexander, and of an anonymous tombstone, because Avertius is never attached to the fragments that we have, that he made use of an anonymous tombstone, put these two tombstones together, which you, people could see in Heropolis, and proof that this inscription is very old from the second century, that he then created his fiction of this Avertius inscription, around which is built the entire Vita, because it's condensed, it's built on this kind of a journey to Rome and to see the queen. Now, for the um, epigraphers, I've just made a short shock so if we take that, this is the fragment that we have. It's not exactly, but it's, it's, it only should show what, it, what I want to say. Is when we take what we have preserved as a square, as we have so many tombstones which we have seen, we can see the Orion, yeah? So exactly where Aurelius had stopped the, the text with these characters, and I've taken the, the, the size of these characters, yeah? The text runs out of the square. So that's the first anomaly. But that's only helping and supporting uh, the argument. What I think was the case, we have two spolia, which have been used in the fifth century by the author of the Vita. And this author of the Vita has then created a fictive bishop of Avertius in the second century. And this Avertius of the second century has created in our minds of scholarship until today the idea of an Avertius inscription. I've asked at the beginning, what do we know about Avertius? Eusebius knows a certain Avertius who is linked to the Montanists, but that's the only Avertius we know, but he's not from Hierapolis. Now, the very first Hierapolis the very first Hierapolis bishop or bishop of Hierapolis that we know is present at the Council of Chalcedon in 451. And I pay you a glass of beer tonight if you give me the name of this bishop. No? Easier. Not Wolfgang, <laughs> not Stefano. No, the bishop, the very, yeah, exactly. So the very first bishop that we know of who sits in Alexandria, uh, sorry, who sits in Chalcedon and sides with the Chalcedonian Catholic position, signs this document with Avertius. So I think the whole story round up to, at the end is that the author of the Vita intended to give his bishop, Avertius, a strong standing at the council. He's not known for anything he's written. So the Vita writer gives him a standing at the council of Chalcedon because he comes from a city 
which has such a long history, not only a long history, it's got a history that converted the Roman Empire by converting Mark Aurel's family. So I think the, the lesson I wanted to convey is when we, when we stop thinking that we know what we see, but when we learn like the epigraphers that what we see is deceptive and that we first have to understand what the characters mean and that we always have to be skeptical about all explanations that, us, that are given to us because it's all preconditioned. Then we get a sense of how complex inscriptions are. And when I handed in the manuscript to Cambridge University Press, I had 16 pages review by an epigrapher. And he told me, I don't know, anonymously, of course, he told me I could have come to the same conclusion as you without retrospection. And I, in the footnote, I, I recommend him for that because I say uh, a, a new form of, of a historiography should not and could not uh, dispute any other form of historiography. We should come to the same conclusion. The only question is, is it better to hold the light from light, from left or from right? And sometimes it is important to have from above or from below. Thank you.